Welcome to our eight-week family caregiver education series hosted by the Central Okanagan Hospice Association in partnership with Vantage Living and Jumpstart Communications. Through challenging times and especially during this pandemic, we know family caregivers are carrying more responsibilities in caring for their loved ones, carrying more stress with varying restrictions in place, and some having to make some life-changing decisions to be closer to their family. Through this eight-week caregiver education series, we hope that family caregivers will be able to build confidence, resiliency, skills, and learn more about self-compassion and self-care. We call this filling up our toolkits. The Central Okanagan Hospice Association has been providing supportive care programs and services to individuals living with a serious illness and supporting their families along the way for 39 years. This may be through our community hospice visiting program, wellness program, vigil services, or providing grief support. Our programs complement the medical care to bring an integrated approach to palliative care by providing emotional, social, practical, and spiritual supports with trained, compassionate, and dedicated volunteers and our professional staff. All of our services are offered at no cost, so there are no barriers to access our services when and where needed, thanks to the generosity of our community. The Koha Aga Center is located on Cooper Road, and we have a lending library full of resources and great reading materials for family caregivers. Today's topic is Self-Care and Self-Compassion by Mary Ellen McNaughton. Mary Ellen has a Master's in Counseling Psychology and has been working with individuals, couples and groups for over 20 years, specializing in self-awareness, communication and relationship health. She has specialized in bereavement counseling, couples counseling, divorce coaching and chronic pain education. She's also certified as a non-violent communication trainer and uses that frame to help clients with clarity and empowerment as they discover their resources, strengths, and the essence of what they truly value. She believes that compassionate communication often brings with an awareness of inner dialogue or self-talk and is aligned with the self-compassion research of Kristen Neff. Good morning. So before we start, um, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking this morning from the unceded territory of the Okanagan people. Are you okay? Yep. I'd also just like to acknowledge um, what we are living in unprecedented times. During this pandemic, with a sense of disconnection and isolation and fear, um, self-care and self-compassion are probably more important than ever before. I just um, was listening last week to the presentation and I heard someone um, asking about, how, how do you know when you need respite as a caregiver? And a su suggestion I would have is probably build respite into your care plan from the beginning. And I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to come revisit this um, later on in my presentation. But if you wait until you think you need it, you probably waited too long. So something just to be aware that we often um, leave self-care and self-connection um, too long before we notice how much we really do need it. Okay, so let's start self-compassion and self-care in the context of, of caregiving. So most of us want more capacity for compassion in life, for sure, and certainly in, in caregiving. Um, who knew, however, that um, having compassion for yourself is probably one of the best ways to accomplish that goal. So my goal this morning is to give you some insight, hopefully some understanding about self-compassion, as well as at least one strategy to experience more of it in your life. And it's my hope that this will improve your quality of life, not only for you, but for the people that you, you care about. So it's not 
shifting. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so what is compassion? Um, there's many definitions. Um, one I like is when love meets suffering and stays loving. And that's by uh, Kristen Neff. Most of the definitions that you'll find of compassion um, talk about some form of kindness, but often with a deeper meaning. And usually there's some sense of to suffer with. So compassion means um, someone else's heartbreak becomes our own heartbreak or someone else's suffering becomes our suffering. So there's that sense that it's, um, it's kindness, but it's also um, a sharing of uh, experience. What I notice with that definition is there's this sense that compassion is something that you give to someone else. And what I really want to talk about this morning is how do you treat yourself when you are suffering? You've probably all heard of you, you can't give from an empty cup or you can't give from an empty well. Um, also, it's fairly common, um, the idea that you put your own oxygen mask on first before you support someone else. So we, we have kind of an understanding of that. But there's definitely a sense that compassion is something that we give to someone else. So wh why do we have that sense that compassion is, is really for other people? Um, this is a book that I would highly recommend. Uh, it's called Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. And what I love about uh, Kristen Neff and the work that she does is that everything that she talks about has been researched and validated with research. So she has a, a website as well as this um, book. She has a couple books out now. What I like about her website is there's actually a scale on there so you can go on her website and test, see how self-compassionate you are. And you can do that several times. And as you become more self-compassionate, you can notice your, your progress. But she, um, unlike a lot of people who work in um, this kind of self-help field, um, she doesn't say things because she intuitively feels those things are true. She only makes statements that she's backed up with research. So. Self-compassion is something that she became interested in early in her life, and she just started doing her research uh, at the University of Texas on self-compassion. So everything that I'm going to be talking about this morning are things um, that she's talked about and she's researched and they're borne out by, by research. So her definition of self-compassion is a mindful awareness of your own suffering. And this is something that's interesting. Often we don't even recognize when we are suffering. We, we've learned very quickly just to kind of keep going and go beyond um, whatever, we're, whatever situation we're in. We often don't even recognize our suffering in that context. Responding with, with kindness to ourselves and our own suffering and also a sense of common humanity, recognizing that we all suffer. So it's not something that's unique to us. And often when we are suffering, we feel very isolated. So another definition that she puts out is treating our own suffering with the same kindness and understanding that we would treat someone, the suffering of someone we truly loved. So I think that's um, it probably puts it into a nutshell. It's really treating our own suffering with the same kindness and understanding that we would treat the suffering of someone that we truly loved, a good friend or a child or someone in our care. So the first question I'd like to ask is what comes to mind when you think about self-compassion? Is there any kind of a negative thought that kind of comes up um, when you think of self-compassion? And if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, um, I'd love to just uh, have a sense. I'd love to hear what anyone uh, might come up with with that. Comments are coming in saying guilt, 
I start to cry. Oh, wow. No negativity whatsoever. Oh, that's good. My critical inner voice is always pretty loud. Mm -hmm. Yes, guilt is very common. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, of uh, kind of those kind of thoughts kind of come pretty common and they come quite quickly. So what um, she's found again in her research, some really common thoughts that come up when people think about self-compassion, um, that it leads to being self-indulgent, that there's a sense that you'll just um, be too, too focused on yourself, uh, leads to selfishness, being uh, narcissistic, um, sometimes it's viewed as a form of self-pity and it encourages wallowing. Um, wallowing is a really loaded word, I have to say, and even just, it's interesting how if you think of words as just vehicles that um, we put meaning to, um, we really put a lot of negative or positive charge to certain words, and I think wallowing has a very negative uh, connotation. Um, Often there's a thought that self-compassion leads to weakness. And definitely the idea that it undermines motivation. We are really socialized with the idea that we have to be tough on ourselves. We have to be really um, disciplined and hard on ourselves in order to really accomplish what we want to accomplish. We, we need to have toughness and self-compassion would probably be counterproductive. So, there's a lot of, of, of uh, kind of prevailing kind of ideas and sentiments that we deal with in everyday life that kind of goes against even having um, a focus or having a goal of having more self-compassion. Well, what does the science actually say about this? So let's find out what actually is borne out about self-compassion. Research on self-compassion shows that in the, in the um, frame of uh, caregivers, for sure, there's less burnout and compassion fatigue. The more self-compassion you have, the less likely you are to have burnout. Um, the more satisfaction with the caregiving role happens when you have self-compassion. And um, <clears throat> Krista Neff happens to be the parent of an autistic child. So she's done some specific research on uh, parents of autistic children and an increase in well being for parents of autistic children. Re um, research on self compassion shows it's linked to strength, coping, and resilience. People are actually less self focused when they have more self compassion. They have a greater sense of connectedness. Uh, they've done research with veterans and what they've found is that veterans who had more self-compassion were less likely to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder afterwards. So self-compassion actually was a way of almost immunizing them to um, PTSD. So in other words, people become stronger basically when they become an ally to themselves. A very wise woman said, I learned a long time ago, the wisest thing I can do is be on my own side. And that's what we're gonna talk about is recognizing how much um, in so many different ways that we can actually not be on our own side and not even recognize or realize that. Research on self-compassion also shows a reduction in negative mindset states. So things like anxiety, depression, stress, rumination, perfectionism, shame, all reduced um, when you have more self-compassion. And an increase in positive mind states, life satisfaction, happiness, connectedness, self-confidence, optimism, curiosity, and gratitude. So research basically shows that self-compassion enhances immune function, so people are less likely to get sick. It decreases your experience of pain, and that includes chronic pain. 
and it's a good alternative to self-esteem. So I'd like to do a little bit of a segue here and talk a bit about self-esteem as opposed to uh, self-compassion. So here's a question for you before I do that. Um, so when you think about self-esteem as a caregiver, do you ever find that you kind of judge yourself to be maybe inadequate to the challenge that you find yourself um, with at the moment, not really doing a good enough job? Um, do you find uh, a sense of feeling like things are falling through the cracks, uh, thoughts that you might not necessarily enhance your self-esteem. So any anybody relate to any thoughts like that? We have yes, helpless feeling. Yes, voices in my head. One person says sad but true. Mm -hmm. Helpless, yeah, definitely. Mostly overwhelmed and frustrated. Mm -hmm. And often with those kind of feelings, that voice in your head or saying those kinds of things. So, so just, to, just to kind of draw a distinction um, between self-esteem and self-compassion, to understand that self-esteem is actually a judgment that we're better than average. So unfortunately, no one's better than average at everything. And most of us are better than average at some things and then kind of average or below average at others. So if we feel average or below average, it's often tempting to judge ourselves, which we do, we have amazing practice and we do a lot. And oftentimes we will judge other people as well as kind of a defense against the fact that we're judging ourselves. It's like a ping pong table going back and forth. So this is something it's, uh, again, we're socialized to um, think that self-esteem is something that we should really focus on and aim for. And yet what we're learning is that it's actually not necessarily something for our emotional health and well-being. However, I have to admit, even for myself, it's, I struggle with, um, we sort of are socialized to get praise and accolades and we're used to being told, oh, wow, that was way better than average, you know, whether maybe it really was or not. So for example, you know, for myself, if someone says, oh, you know, thank you so much, that presentation was like really average, um, just feels, it just doesn't quite do it. And yet, what's wrong with that? That's actually, that's good. It means it's not below average. So, but it's, it's something that's just not what we're programmed to hear. And it really does work against us in many ways. So if you think about self-esteem and self-compassion and comparing the two, Self-esteem is based on a judgment of success, how successful you are. So in a sense, it's kind of a fair weather friend in a way because it deserts you when you need it the most. And it can lead to judgments of yourself. You put yourself down. Someone talked about the voice in your head. It also leads to judgment of other people. So disconnection, um, racism, bullying. Um, over the last decade, there's been a real focus on self-esteem in the school system. And there's also been a real rise in bullying in the, in the school system. So there's, you know, people are starting to take a, a second look at um, maybe shifting the focus a bit or, or shifting um, how they're working with self-esteem in the school system, for sure. So if you look at self-compassion, it's based on, it's kind of a self-worth but it's less contingent on success. In other words, you don't need to be successful to have self-compassion. It's working with the idea that we're all flawed and it's safe to make a mistake and admit that you're vulnerable. It actually leads to more capacity for compassion for other people. So more capacity for compassion, not less. So, Another thing, this is something that um, Kristen Neff talks about self-compassion. I have not seen this anywhere else. And I, and I really think this is an amazing um, concept. 
she talks about the yin and yang of compassion. So the yin of compassion, according to her, is that sort of that tender, comforting, soothing energy, that sort of loving, connected presence. This is what I actually think of when I think of compassion. I think of this tender, sort of comforting, soothing uh, energy. But the yang of compassion is that fierce energy. It's that providing protection, setting boundaries. It's, it's kind of the mama bear or the, the lioness. So it's something that motivates change by being assertive towards your goals and dreams. It's kind of, it's like the warrior energy. So you stand strong, even if your context is not supportive to what you're standing strong for. For example, Gandhi or Martin Luther King. Um, so it's kind of, supposedly it's the masculine component. However, I have to notice that the lioness and the mama bear are, are feminine. So it's just the, the fiercer energy. And, and often when we have that kind of energy, we don't recognize that as compassion, but it's definitely part of compassion. I really like, I like that, that concept. So again, so you imagine bringing the yin and yang into balance the yin being that comforting, soothing, validating energy that you have for yourself on the inside, and yang being the protecting, motivating, um, providing for, acting out in the world um, form of, of compassion that we are out in the world. So I'm just wondering, before I go any further, are there any questions so far about anything that I've talked about, anything that um, any or comments? Does that make sense or does it connect for anyone? Some comments earlier were uh, seems like one is always supposed to do something. I don't think this is helpful. Mm -hmm. A thought that compassion comes after being sick or unwell. It sometimes feels like you are on a treadmill and can quite get to, can't quite, quite, quite get to where you should be. Mm -hmm. And lots of positive comments here. Um, how to balance uh, yin and yang, are there steps? Um, not specific, well, we'll kind of, as we go along, we'll, we'll probably touch on it. We can come back to that question. I don't quite have an answer for it in the moment, but for the doing part, there's definitely that sense that um, I think that goes to self-esteem as well, that we feel like we have to do something, we have to accomplish something, we have to prove that we're worthy of love and care and compassion. So I think self-compassion is allowing ourselves just to have compassion for ourselves, whether we're doing it something or not. One more comment here it says self-compassion can be difficult when one feels exhausted. Thank you. That is so, so true. And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about, um, um, I think we'll answer the question around the yin and yang of, of uh, self-compassion as we carry on as well. But yeah, when oftentimes, again, that treadmill is often a treadmill, I think that's fueled by self-esteem as opposed to self-compassion. So, I think, well, I'll just continue on and then we might come back to some, to actually two of those questions. So Krista Neff, as I mentioned at the, right at the beginning, she envisions self-compassion as having three components, common humanity, kindness, and mindfulness. So we'll start out with common humanity. Um, it's the idea that we all are imperfect. We are all wired for struggle. An analogy in the, in the natural world is the idea that um, if you assist uh, a butterfly to get out of the cocoon, it actually decreases its chances of survival in the world. So we have a sense that, you know, struggle is somehow unusual. It's like, oh, you know, I have struggle as if, you know, that's something that's unique or something that unexpected in life. And what the first thing she likes to really hone in on is that struggle is so common to just being human. It's, it's just part of being human. 
Um, and it's it often when we when we're involved in struggle, we feel isolated, like we are the only one having struggle and, and no one else in the world is experiencing that. So seeing our experience as part of what it means to be human um, helps so that it's not doesn't feel so abnormal or so isolating. I think one of the things that's interesting, um, we tell fa our, our children fairy tales where the perfect prince, prince and princess ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. And it's actually kind of a cruel myth in a way because it's just not true. It's not true for anyone. No one rides off into the sunset and lives happily ever after. So why do we set up our children to think and have that kind of expectation? Because in reality, we're all imperfect, we all struggle, we all suffer, and we all deal with pain in life. So recognizing that we're not alone in our suffering and struggle can actually be comforting. The second thing she talks about is self-kindness as opposed to self-judgment. So treating yourself with care and understanding rather than noticing that voice in our head that can be very harsh and very judgmental. We can choose to actively soothe and comfort ourselves, treating ourselves with kindness and tenderness when we struggle and suffer. Unfortunately, it's all too common to be extremely critical and hard on ourselves when we perceive that we've made a mistake or that we've done something in a way that's not perfect or in our mind that what we see as, as perfection. And then mindfulness. And what she means by that is basically acknowledging pain without going to extreme. And the extreme can be in one side or the other. So the extreme can be just completely running away and blocking it out, going into denial and, and just refusing to feel pain at all, feel those kind of uh, painful feelings. Or the other side of that is catastrophizing and basically going down the rabbit hole with it, having you know really high drama. So either one of those things, it's basically you're connecting with, with your pain and, and feeling, but it's kind of going to extremes on either side, as opposed to just being mindful, just being with, with it. So in a sense, the mindfulness part is accepting the experience. This is what I'm feeling. This is the pain. And self-compassion is caring for that experience. So in other words, with mindfulness, it's what am I experiencing right now? And self-compassion is what do I need right now? So the fundamental question with self-compassion is what do I need? And this is an interesting question because it's not a question that we ask ourselves very often. What do I need? We ask ourselves, what am I supposed to do? What is my obligation? What is expected of me here in this situation? But very seldom, we're not socialized to ask, what do I need? What do I need in this, in this situation? And it can be confusing because often when we do ponder, what do I need? Um, a lot of things come up. For example, more than one need often is usually, I would say more than one need. For example, at, one, at this moment, you might be very aware that just your very basic need for rest is not being met. You're, someone was saying you're exhausted, you're weary. So you might notice if you ask yourself, what do I need right now? I'm feeling tired, I think I need rest. But at the same time, you have the, the need for the well-being of your loved one. And in that moment, that might be more important. So recognizing that the first thing you'll notice is when you start looking at what are my needs, they're never just one, there's usually more than one. And then you have to prioritize, okay, so what need am I going to focus on and try to meet in this moment? And as a caregiver, often the need for your, the well-being of your loved one is going to be a priority over your own need. And, and that makes sense. That's you know one of the reasons you're there. That's something you have to be careful about, however, because if you continue constantly to put your own needs aside, that's when you get into um, compassion fatigue and, and the kinds of things where um, you really need to really focus on self-compassion. 
So needs, when I, when I say need, I'm talking about physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs. So you've probably heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he talks about just your basic needs for survival, safety needs and um, physiological needs for air and water and shelter and food and those kinds of things. And then your psychological needs, so self-esteem, social needs, relationship needs. And then the top tip of that pyramid is sort of self-actualization. You might even say spiritual needs would be in that category. I had to put this in uh, the updated pandemic um, hierarchy of needs. The bottom one is battery power and Wi-Fi because in this virtual world, we need device optimization in order to have our needs met, especially to have our social needs met for uh, connection. So, <laughs> but regardless of how we prioritize our needs, most of us have not been socialized to focus on needs. Once our base, well, once our basic needs for survival, I mean, certainly we focus on our basic needs, hopefully just for um, survival. But once those socialized, <clears throat> once those basic survival needs are met, um, we actually are not socialized to focus on needs. So for example, if you were to look at this list of just this is by no means um, a complete list, but just this gives you sort of an idea of the different categories, the different types of needs that we might be looking at. So once our need for survival are met, our deeper needs often go unmet for a very long time, mostly because we, we just don't think about it. And like you, someone was mentioning, if you feel like you're just doing one thing and the next thing and the next thing you're on a treadmill and you're exhausted, you don't really have time to put aside some time to focus on and, and start to think about, well, what, what, are my, what are my other needs? So what happens often is that you actually lose touch with them and you can't even identify them anymore. So if someone were to say to you, um, you know, what do you need? in terms of you know, relationship or other categories of needs, you probably couldn't even say because you really haven't uh, connected with those needs for a very long time. So right now in this moment, if you were to look at this list, can you just choose a need that you think is important to you? and just put it in the chat. So we have needs around connection. Um, it could be communication, closeness, companionship, uh, compassion, consideration. Um, sometimes people have a real priority on honesty, integrity. Um, what about your need for play? Have you ever, have you thought recently about, you know, what do you do to meet your need for play and joy, humor? Um, a need for meaning, creativity, um, just even uh, autonomy, sort of a sense of freedom and choice, as well as your physical well being. So, if you wouldn't mind just um, putting, just pick one need that you feel like is important to you, whether you've thought about it before, maybe something you haven't thought about for a long time and just put in the chat. We have play and humor during COVID, joy, laughter, space, stimulation, meaning, spontaneity, belonging, joy again, to be understood, um, mm -hmm. compassion, uh, companionship and fun, freedom. Perfect. Okay, so hopefully you've written those down somewhere as well. Just hang on to that need. So now I'm gonna ask you, can you imagine how that need might be met? So again, the first step is to focus on the need and then imagine, is there a strategy that you can imagine to meet that need? So that's you know, something that might not pop into your mind immediately, but it's something for you to think about. If that need is important to you, then even the first step is to recognize and notice. 
And then it's to start thinking about, you know, how could that meet be met if it hasn't been met? And the next question is, has it been met recently? How has it been met? So maybe it has been met and that's something you can think about having more in your life, having other situations where that need might be met. So just looking at a needs list and just starting to have an awareness of things that um, are important to you that maybe you haven't thought about for a while is actually a positive step in the right direction. So just to reiterate, your ability to have self-compassion depends on your ability to answer the question, what do I need? So I'm pretty sure that that need list has been sent out to people. If it hasn't, we can send it out. But I often with my clients um, suggest that they put a needs list on the fridge or in the car or something where they can just look at it and just start thinking about when they have feeling confused and uncertain, just look at, you know, what, what need isn't being met right now? What, what could I focus on here? So self-compassion, um, you want to know what do I need right now? Self-care is acknowledging that need, having kindness and empathy for yourself in that place of need, having that need, and finding strategies to meet the need. So before we go any further, there's just one heads up. There's something that um, I just want you to be aware of uh, in the context of self-compassion. Again, this is something very unique to um, Kristen Neff. Um, and this has, again, been borne out by research. Sometimes we have a sense that the need um, can't be met and that, you know, it probably will never be met. And sometimes we get that, we make that decision early in life that certain needs of ours will never be met. Um, and that's really extremely painful and isolating. So what we often will do in that situation is we will decide that we don't have that need anymore. We no longer have that need. It just feels easier to just disconnect from that need. And that is actually happens very, fairly frequently. And sometimes it's been even decades that we've not focused on that deeper need or given ourselves any kind of compassion for the struggle and pain and deep suffering that we have, sometimes even longer than decades. So something I just want to bring to your attention is something called backdraft. And in um, the world of uh, firefighting, it's a very common expression. And it, what it is is an ex explosive surge of fire that's produced when there's a sudden mixing of fresh air with hot surfaces. So in terms of you know, the fire might seem like it's out, but if all the doors are shut and it's still very hot, if you open the door to fresh air, there'll be a surge or explosion of, of fire. Interesting enough, that can happen with self-compassion. So what backdraft is in self-compassion is the distress that we give ourselves, when we give ourselves kindness and compassion, after a very long time of, of not doing that. And as we mentioned, decades or even longer. It's almost, it's like our heart is hot with suffering that's accumulated over a very long time, sometimes for a lifetime. So that when we open the door of our hearts to that fresh air of compassion, that old pain and fear just explode out in really unpredictable um, ways. This is something to understand as well. I, I certainly have seen this in terms of giving someone else compassion who has not given themselves or has not received compassion. Um, there can also be, it's almost like an explosion of, of anger um, in a reaction because it's just so unfamiliar. It's, it's, a, it's a, almost like a form of protection. So what backdraft can look like, how you can recognize backdraft is basically intensity. So it can be intensity emotionally. So you can all of a sudden, you have shame before, but all of a sudden you feel intense shame or intense fear or intense sadness. 
um, mentally you can have this sense of uh, telling yourself I'm alone or I'm unworthy and all of a sudden it's it's more intense it's it's like you know before it was kind of subliminal and we're almost not aware of it and now you're totally you know intensely aware of it and even physically there can be sort of a body memory of aches and pains that you've you've had in the past and what happens is that it seems to appear out of nowhere and it doesn't seem to make any sense so you can feel sort of uneasy numb uh, unsafe these are very common uh, reactions to you know, in it, giving yourself compassion, self-compassion for the first time. So just to let you know, um, you're not doing it wrong. It actually is a sign that you're doing it right. Um, you might want to go a little, a little bit more slowly, but, you know, just taking a smaller step and realizing that one degree course correction, um, there's a a thing on an airplane that does one degree course correction constantly throughout a flight. And if that doesn't work, it, it's a difference between Denver and Miami. So sometimes it can feel overwhelming when it feels like there's a lot of things in your life that you want to change. And it's helpful to understand that just a one degree course correction, just a very slight subtle change um, over time, if held consistently, will make a huge, a huge difference. And I, I think with self-compassion, it's something to keep in mind because it is something that, especially if uh, you're not used to it, it can um, almost feel worse before it feels, feels better. So I'm gonna stop for questions at this point. I feel like I've kind of given a lot of uh, information and I just wonder if there's any any questions or we have one comment uh, from a little bit earlier here that says utilize someone in your support group like family yes uh, the need has been met however it was so so hard to ask for help mm -hmm. yeah that could definitely be something as well in terms of meeting your own need it often means making a request of someone else and that can be very difficult and um, it's something that you're not used to for sure and also another comment earlier when caregiving becomes your world and your loved one is failing and you want to make a difference self-esteem can be low as the feeling of failure mm -hmm. what a perfect place to understand the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion and really start shifting to self-compassion. That will make a huge, a huge difference, I think. One commenter actually says, this is by far the most difficult class I could take. <laughs> yes, yes, it is because it's so foreign. It's just, it's not what we're socialized. It's not how we're socialized, so. Um, what I can say is, you know, you've taken your first step into a direction that I think will make a huge difference over time. So again, remember one degree course correction. You can't change everything overnight. Just know that, you know, I've, I've made a recommendation of a book that I think you'll find helpful and um, recognize that the overwhelm could be something that just tells you how important this is for you to maybe take a look at. One comment here says self-awareness is huge, not only to ourselves, but to those around us. Absolutely. That's something that we're come, becoming so aware of is your own self-awareness permeates out to other people. So it makes such a diff, it's such a gift to the people around you to have that sense of understanding and awareness of yourself. Absolutely. All right, we had some great questions uh, during the break here. Okay. Um, I'll read them out. Uh, I think the examples you gave are great as sometimes self-compassion is difficult to make happen, sometimes easier to just carry on. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. And that's why we do, because it, you know that's kind of what's expected and it does seem easier because we don't, we don't have a, a framework. We don't have a blueprint of, okay, now it's time for self-compassion. Now it's time to, um, you know, sharpen the, 
the sword, I think, or sharpen the knife, as they, they say. Yeah, so true. One uh, comment says, this is all fine, but in real life, we can sit back and be subjected. Life goes on. Um, my family member needs fed to be fed, changed, cleaned during COVID. There is no respite or days off. How can I stop and focus on me when there isn't enough hours in the day to meet all the other demands? That is such a good question. I really appreciate that question. And it, it brings me back to um, what I was saying at the beginning about um, how do you decide when you need respite? And what I would say is that you're almost having a crisis of, of creativity. So yes, I hear you. It's very difficult to ask for support because oftentimes we don't even know specifically what needs of ours need to be met and, and what is even available or possible. But I think that if you think about, I, I noticed you said there's no respite. Um, if you think about what, what do you think respite is? I mean, rest, respite. Um, to imagine, and I, I talk about this later, but I'm gonna talk about it now, essence and form. The essence is the need and the form is all the different ways that could possibly be used to meet that need. And when you get to the essence, so in when you're saying yes, but my loved one needs to have all these needs of theirs met, and it doesn't seem like there's any um, other support for you, just to step back and take the time to think about. So uh, what what is it that I really do need here? Your first step is to recognize that you have a need and then to recognize that there probably are ways that those needs could be met. There's probably people that might be willing to help you if they knew specifically what the need is. Oftentimes people don't step in and, and um, asked if people need support because they don't know what to offer. They don't know what that person needs. And often the, the best, the first step and the um, really important step is to have a clear idea yourself of what would be helpful to you in the situation. It sounds like where you're feeling quite overwhelmed right now. What is one thing that could be helpful to you? And I'm sure, you know, if you look in your field of, of vision, is there anyone, is there, there's so many creative and and different ways to meet a need that I would invite you just to see that even just to recognize what your needs are is a first step and then to open the idea that it's possible that this situation can shift for you. So thank you for that question. Okay, so let's um, just come back. Got a little bit more information for you, another kind of strategy for you. So if we think about strategies to discover what the need is, because we're sort of, no, I'm noticing, and it's, it's very common actually, that people really don't know what they do need. They know they're overwhelmed. They know that there's so many things they have to do. It feels like they can't possibly do it all. But if someone were to say, okay, well, what do you need? It's almost a blank. They really still just don't know how to articulate what they actually need. So one way to start to pay it is to start to pay attention to your inner dialogue. Like, what are you telling yourself? Because that's a good place to start to understand. When you look at what you're telling yourself, it is a clue to what the need might be. And another is to focus on feelings, what you're feeling in the moment. So looking at your inner dialogue, what do you say to yourself when you perceive that you have made a mistake? So I want you to just in this moment, just think about a time when you think, oh my goodness, I really blew that. I, I did that wrong. Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. What's the next thing that you say to yourself? What do you say to yourself when you feel like your performance has been imperfect. Just wondering if there's any comments in the chat. I will give a few moments for that. Um, but in the meantime, we have one commenter that says, um, what do you suggest when a caregiver takes a compassionate break and loves it? It is amazing. However, very difficult to get back into the caregiving mode afterwards. Afterwards, it is way more painful than before. 
I'm doing the best that I can. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that it, it's an indication that you, it needs to happen more frequently. And again, that uh, crisis of creativity is that now you are aware of how much you need it. And especially I know going back, it seems like it's more, um, it's more difficult. So again, we sometimes go to the place of saying, okay, well, I won't take the, the break then because then it won't be more difficult. That is one strategy, but my suggestion is to find a strategy where you can take shorter breaks, but more frequently. And I think that will be a better strategy for you. We have some responses here. One person says, oh, great, air out of my balloon. And the other says, use humor. Mm -hmm. That can be good. So that's, so yeah, sometimes we can laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves seriously. Um, but I think sometimes we, we do tend to beat ourselves up. So again, to think about how do you treat yourself when you are suffering? And, and I think part of it is to recognize that you are suffering. So oftentimes we go straight into our uh, inner dialogue critic who just will decide to beat you up when you're suffering and not even recognize it. You know, sometimes when you make a mistake and you feel guilty, you are actually suffering in that moment. We have some comments here that says, I hate getting stuff wrong, tend to beat myself up for a while as uh, I'm processing, um, affirm, I, I unconditionally love and accept myself just the way I am and breathe as a way to uh, respond to that. Excellent, yeah. Sometimes when the care aides come in, I feel they disapprove of something. I just want to curl up in a corner, sometimes anger. Uh, some thoughts are, what is wrong with me? Mm, absolutely. So perfect example of often what happens is what's triggered inside of you is your own inner critic. And most of us have downloaded uh, a very intense inner critic that often will come out at those times when we perceive that we've made a mistake or that we're suffering. So now if you think about what would you say to a friend when they perceive that they've made a mistake? So when you think about what you say to yourself, how you beat yourself up, and as that person was mentioning, you want to curl up into a ball and feel like you absolutely, you know, it often triggers very low self-esteem. What would you say to a friend who even made maybe even exactly the same mistake that you made? And I think what you'll notice is what you say to a friend is probably very different than what you would say to yourself. Any comments? We boost our friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We often say something very encouraging to a friend. And if that same situation had happened for ourselves, we would be absolutely saying the opposite. So inner dialogue is basically, what am I telling myself? Um, and the first thing you probably notice when you start to look at your own inner dialogue is that it's not very compassionate. In fact, most of us have downloaded um, an inner critic that is often relentless. It's often um, just on the other side of almost anything we do, even if it's not even necessarily a mistake, but it's not as good as we think we could have done. Um, it's, it's kind of onto us. So your inner dialogue can be the first clue to what need of yours is not being met. So it can be really helpful to become aware of your own story and become aware of what you're telling yourself. So for example, if I'm telling myself, oh my goodness, I'm always behind. I just can't seem to get everything done. It always seems to be more that I can do. If you felt like you were telling yourself that, what, what needs of yours do you think might need to be met? Any, any uh, suggestions? If you think about it, if you find yourself telling yourself that, what need of yours is not being met? What would be a need that would be helpful to have met in that situation? A 
something related. Um, it's a lesson to breathe, open a window and breathe. Mm -hmm. External affirmation, support. Support, yes. Yeah, could be support, could be understanding, could be rest. Support Always. and help, being mm -hmm. able to ask for help. Being, yes. Focus on one item to accomplish. Excellent. Yeah. So another way to discover what needs of yours are not being met is to figure out what you're feeling in the moment. So this is a list of uh, feelings. And again, this is another list with my clients that I often say, keep it with you and look at it frequently. Um, the first thing you'll notice about this list of feelings is that the top part of it are feelings that you have when needs are not being met. So things like anger, confusion, fear. Um, and you'll also notice with anger that there's kind of a continuum with anger from being mildly irritated to being enraged. And then, you know, similar with, with other, with fear as well, you can be a little bit uncertain or you could be terrified. On the bottom are feelings that you feel when needs are being met. So appreciation, compassion, confidence, joy. So first of all, you can recognize that there's feelings that point you in the direction of needs that are met and feelings when needs are not being met. So when you look at, so the, the, the one thing that I find really uh, interesting is often when we express our feelings, it's almost as if you're playing a tuba in the sense that you're, when you say, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good, feeling bad, good, bad. But what does that really mean? And what I find is when people develop a vocabulary for feelings, there's a sense of being able to get in touch with more feelings and get in touch with where they are in any given moment with respect to feelings. And often as they start searching for feelings, if they have more vocabulary, they start using different words to express it. When they hit on something that really connects with the feeling that they have, there's almost a sense of relief. It's like, oh yeah, you know, actually I'm feeling confused or I'm feeling discouraged or actually I have mixed feelings. I'm feeling this feeling and I'm feeling this feeling at the same time. And that doesn't even make any sense. It's, it's confusing or it's overwhelming. So just to have a vocabulary for feelings can be really, really helpful. And sometimes, again, just to look at those, that list of things and ask yourself, okay, so yeah, I'm feeling pain, but am I feeling, you know, depressed or is it grief or am I feeling melancholy, you know, or am I other categories, am I feeling disgruntled or disconnected? So really connecting with yourself and figuring out what you are feeling. So again, I'm going to ask you right now in this moment, what are you feeling? So if you wouldn't mind just um, writing in the chat and just be aware, um, there's probably gonna be more than one feeling. Is there one kind of um, prevalent feeling, feeling that's there, that's kind of stronger a little bit than the others? If you just wanna put those in the chat. Any takers on the phone? <laughs> no. And then once you get a sense of what you're feeling, look at, try to decide what, is there a need being met? Is it a, is a positive feeling or is there a need not being met? So or if you're feeling um, fatigue or bored, then, um, you know, a need for interest or meaning or purpose or a need for rest. So start noticing when you have a feeling, when you, clue into a feeling what, what the need is that's meant. So we got some comments here on what are you feeling? Um, one person says, appreciation for your efforts of teaching us. Oh, thank you. Relaxed, curious, interested, alert, positive, mm -hmm. hopeful and encouraged, validated. Great. Fatigued. Yes. Overwhelmed and need rest. 
Perfect. So a need and a feeling and then a need. Overwhelmed, need rest. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, if you think about feelings as kind of a signpost that point you in the direction of your needs. So if you have kind of uncomfortable feelings and there's needs that are not met and comfortable feelings are pointing you to needs that are met, it can be very valuable to be aware of the needs that are met when you're having comfortable feelings as well. So your needs speak also to our common humanity. And you'll notice that with needs, we can all relate. Again, it's, it's that um, essence and form that I mentioned before. The need is the essence. The need is the thing that we can all relate to. So for example, if you have a need for uh, inclusion or connection, that can, that can be very different for different people. So a need for inclusion could look like being invited or you know, having someone uh, put your name down in, in the list of you know, the group of people, or it could, there's so many different ways that that need could be met. So again, to recognize that when you go to the need, then the universe kind of opens because there are infinite numbers of strategies to meet that need. Um, there's a, a definition of misery that I, I love and, and basically what the definition is, um, a definition of misery is to be attached to a strategy because you think it's a need. So if you have an attachment to a certain thing happening and that thing is just not gonna be happening, then you're gonna be miserable because it feels like that need isn't being met. But if that thing is, for example, I want people to come and sit with me and hold my hand while I'm going through this procedure in the, in the hospital and that's not available. If you can understand that that is really a need for support and someone sitting with you and holding your hand is one strategy to meet that need, but it's not the only strategy. Then you can start brainstorming and thinking, well, what's another way? What's another strategy? And certainly in this pandemic, we're coming up with all kinds of creative ways to meet needs for support that we didn't have before. I mean, you could have someone on Zoom staying with you virtually. There's all kinds of, of different ways. And, and basically understanding that going to the need or the essence of what you want really allows you to have such more a scope for having that, that need met. And in a, in a sense, the need is like an anchor. It's when you, we talk about going down the rabbit hole with your feelings, the need is, if you go to the need, it's, it's more stable. You know, it's something that, yes, I have a need for creativity and, and spontaneity. Um, and I'm feeling, you know, really kind of restricted and depressed right now because I can't I can't think of a way to express that need, but when you realize the need is for, for creativity, then maybe you can start thinking of other ways to meet it in the short term until you'll find something that maybe is a, a better fit for it in the long term. So again, recognizing that need is a way to uh, really open up your horizons to a lot of opportunity that you might not, excuse me, ordinarily uh, even be open to. So I'm gonna suggest another book. Um, this book is uh, written by a man who, um, the reason that he wrote this book, basically his life work was looking at what happens to disconnect us from our compassionate nature. His thesis was that we are all born compassionate and we, are, we learn how to block that compassion. He was born uh, in Detroit during the race riots and he saw a lot of violence and a lot of compassion sort of juxtaposed. He had a grandmother who his mother just very compassionately was a, a very compassionate and giving caregiver to his grandmother in his home. But at the same time, people were being killed in the street where he, he was living. And he, he just couldn't make sense of that and basically became a psychologist and wrote a book basically looking at um, what allows us to stay connected to compassion. And he talked about the, the uh, idea and the possibility that you can be triggered out of a compassionate place. So if you can understand what I'm saying by that, can you think of a time when you were triggered and 
you know, you were going along and you felt everything was going well. And then all of a sudden something happened and you weren't feeling compassionate at all. You were feeling the opposite of being compassionate. So um, just that, that sense of, of being triggered. Um, I'll just let you think about that. I don't know if you have to. So how can you tell when you're triggered? So there's physiologically, when you're triggered, you'll notice all of a sudden, if something happens, all of a sudden you're tight, your heart might start racing, your stomach uh, clenches sometimes, you might feel sick or flushed. Emotionally, you might feel instantly angry or maybe feeling guilt, you might be triggered into guilt or overwhelm. Uh, and cognitively, um, the, the cues that let you know that you're triggered away from compassion is um, not so much what you think, but how you think. So thoughts race, like you couldn't possibly uh, speak as quickly as your thoughts are going, or the opposite, sometimes you go blank. So you become confused, disoriented. So it's helpful to notice, but I guess, was there any response to um, recognizing when they're triggered? Uh, one comment said death. Yes, for sure. Any other thoughts? It? <laughs> okay, so I, I hope you understand what I mean by triggered, um, because I think it's something that um, it's helpful to be aware of because it's something that um, we can get to the other side of and get to a place of compassion. So um, this is called the self-empathy flow sheet. And basically what it is, is it's a sheet that allows us to work through a situation if we are triggered. And you'll notice uh, the top, there's uh, cues that let you know it's triggered. And then I'm gonna just kind of briefly go through this uh, flow sheet. So let's just imagine, for example, um, that you're caring for someone and you've just, you know, you've finished all the physical care and you, you know, it's been a busy morning, but it's been, it's been, you know, there's been some challenges, but you've gotten through them and you're feeling like, wow, you finally finished everything and just like, just a little bit of time to relax and just enjoy the company of the person that you're taking care of. So you finish up and you go in and, and ask them to join you for a cup of tea and you think, wouldn't that be nice just to spend a little bit of time enjoy each other's company and have a cup of tea together. And the response you get, you walk in and, and, and say that, and what he says is, I wish you'd just go away and leave me alone. So what happens when you get that response? There's sort of a sense of feeling triggered, right? So how do you know? So you finished everything up, you're feeling encouraged, you got everything done, and now you've got some time to, to spend some quality time, and this is the reaction. So things, all of a sudden you notice you're feeling tight, you're feeling kind of flushed, um, thoughts start racing a little bit, you're feeling a little hurt, kind of irritated. And what are you telling yourself? Things like, wow, I know he doesn't really mean that, but, but wow. You know, um, are you kidding me? Like, I do everything for you, you know? How could you be so ungrateful? How dare you say that to me? You know, you want me to leave? Yeah, I can leave, but I know you don't mean that. So notice this kind of that uh, going back and forth. You're feeling triggered, but then you're feeling guilty because you know that it's not really happening. So so what's happening? How do you, how do you work through a situation like this? Well looking at, first of all, also, what are my feelings? How am I feeling? Oh, first of all, I'm feeling hurt. I feel hurt. I was really looking forward to having a cup of tea and just relaxing and I feel hurt, but I'm feeling kind of irritated too. And actually I'm feeling kind of exasperated because I'm exhausted I'm weary, but I'm also feeling guilty because I know I shouldn't, I shouldn't be feeling irritated because I know that he doesn't mean that. And, but I'm just, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling, feeling discouraged. So now you've got your internal dialogue, what you're telling yourself, and you've got feelings. What are you feeling in this moment? So what needs of mine are not being met in this situation? Well, 
encouragement, right? You're feeling discouraged, like some encouragement, recognition, some acknowledgement, some understanding, consideration, some compassion, some hope. So this is where we can come to a place of having self-compassion, having compassion for ourselves. You'll notice in this, the statement at the bottom here, there's the two words, no wonder. What no wonder does is it gives you space and it gives you permission to feel. Because for most of us, we've been conditioned to not feel. Oh, you know what, you shouldn't feel that way. Don't feel that way. You know the situation, you know what kind of, you know, place you both are in and you know just you should be beyond that kind of feeling right now just get over it so much of our inner dialogue um, our inner critic will tell us basically to not feel no wonder just really gives you all kinds of space and all kinds of permission to feel so it's like you know what no wonder i feel that way of course i feel that way anybody any normal person would feel that way so in this case you know what, no wonder, no wonder I feel hurt and discouraged and exasperated. Any normal person would feel that way in this kind of a situation. No wonder I feel hurt and exasperated because it's so important to me to have understanding and compassion and hope. So this is kind of a, an empathy statement, a compassionate statement that you can make to yourself in any given moment. And what I find when I work with uh, clients, I have them do this on a more regular basis and often uh, the same kind of needs keep popping up because those needs are needs that are important to them. And what can happen is that the two words, no wonder, actually start to become a positive trigger to help you to remember, oh yeah, I can have compassion for myself. I can be kind to myself in this moment. So once you have that statement and you you've kind of worked through it and decided oh yeah okay yeah i'm feeling hurt because i i just really value understanding and compassion and hope you'll notice also underneath there written in red is the word imagine einstein tells us that your imagination is way more important than not important but more powerful i guess than your intellect because imagine your imagination can take you places you've never even been before. So if you were to imagine your need for understanding and compassion and hope, like over the top, totally mad, beyond your wildest dreams, how would you feel? You know, I'm, I'm feeling like we're running out of time, so I'm just going to keep going unless there's any yeah. comments. Um, just really quickly, we had some comments on the triggers. Yeah, I got Oh, you're going to get rid yeah, of that? Yeah. Okay. Um, my sister called and was mad, very mad that we hadn't reached out to, uh, we hadn't reached out to us, then proceeded to rant at my mom about how terrible I was. I was very angry. Mm -hmm. A lot of opportunities to use this, uh, this tool. <laughs> And I didn't get his water quick enough. Wow, anger, big trigger. I'm going as fast as my tired butt can go. Smile and wave. <laughs> Right. I'm, I'm not, I'm not oh. done yet. No, I'm not yeah, done I yet. Know. Okay. Just had to jump back here. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if you were to imagine, and, and this is, I, I found this a really powerful um, thing to do as well. If you imagine your need, whatever the need is that comes in this situation, understanding, compassion, and hope, if you were to imagine those needs met, you might feel relief, you might feel peace, you might feel optimistic, you might feel compassionate, connected, hopeful. So it's something that um, when you allow yourself to imagine, your body doesn't know the difference between what's really happening and what you're imagining. So it's actually, in a sense, it's a, it's a compassion break that you can take for yourself. It's like the, the things that are important to you, like compassion or connection or 
optimism. It's almost like energy frequencies that you're allowing your, yourself to resonate with for a period of time. And it's actually giving your body um, a, a space of time to actually feel an in-body experience of, of self-compassion. So I, I see this as a tool for self-compassion. The needs remind us of our common humanity, that we all can relate to a need, although we might have different priorities in terms of our strategies to meet that need and how important that need is to us. Needs also are helpful um, for mindfulness because they do act as kind of a, a, a stable anchor. So if you see your feelings as kind of that signpost when you start asking yourself, okay, what, what's the need that's not met? It brings you to a place of uh, mindfulness as opposed to going down the rabbit hole with those feelings. And the no wonder statement reminds us that we can be kind to ourselves. Again, and it's also the common humanity of, of course I feel that's way anyone would feel this way in this situation. So it's a way, it's a tool to kind of bring the the kind of the concepts of self-compassion um, to a place where we can start actually having an experience of them in, in a specific in specific situations so this is maybe something i'll, I'll leave you with um, in this moment of suffering suffering is part of life may i be kind to myself may i give myself the compassion that i need so again, something to put up on your mirror or something to, to stick on your fridge, something to, to remember. So what I'll leave you with is if your compassion doesn't include yourself, it's incomplete. So thank you. And again, if there's any questions or comments, I'm happy to. Comments say, thanks for this, very well presented and helpful. Another says, thank you, difficult for me, but very good. Such a powerful session. Um, one person's asking if these sessions are recorded and can be watched later. Yes, they will be recorded um, and sent to you uh, later. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Also, it's hard to self-examine. Today's inspiration is presented by Terry Lee Calhoun. Terry Lee is responsible for clinical oversight and program development for all Vantage long-term care residences. Terry Lee has over 34 years of nursing experience as a registered nurse. She is unique in having worked her nursing career in acute care for 32 years, but truly found her passion in caring for seniors by leading the nursing teams for the past 24 years in long-term care. Although Terry Lee is often on site supporting the clinical teams, Terry Lee's primary work location is at the Kelowna Corporate Office. Her past experiences as the Director of Care in long-term care for over 20 years. She has provided strong nursing leadership and ensured best practice outcomes to enrich seniors' lives. Since 2013, Terry Lee has achieved her gerontology certification through the Canadian Nursing Association to better lead the nursing team in providing the best care for our seniors. Uh, so thanks, Natasha. And as Natasha mentioned, I'm Terry Lee and I am a registered nurse and today I'm going to speak about something that's going to be a little bit interesting, but I've made it um, hopefully supportive and giving you some good ideas. So my topic today is around intimacy and sexual health um, and be inspiration. So I kind of like this picture. Doesn't matter if we're humans or for birds, we all love each other. And uh, especially um, many in the animal uh, kingdom, very much mate for life. So uh, it's certainly a, 
uh, a topic that I'm, I'm very happy to talk about today. So let's start with love. And I love this quote that I found. The number one step to real love is loving yourself. You are worth the effort. Uh, so the old adage, if you can't love yourself, you can't love anyone else, still holds very true. And relationships come and go from friends you had or losing our close ones. What will keep us whole and to live again is to remember to love yourself and to also to accept yourself. So it has to start with ourselves. And uh, the topic we had today is very much about taking care of ourselves and finding that moment. So I want to take you on a journey of love and how important it is to enjoy each step of the life that we live and the relationships that we do have. The simple act of giving someone a small gift, such as a flower that you see on the screen, or being able to touch someone that can bring them love and bring them peace and keep them um, comfortable. So I really found this uh, slide, I really liked it. So it's all the different ways that you can describe love. So um, love you to the moon and back is something that I picked up when my kids were young and I said it over and over again. And to the point that I did start it and they would finish it and go, I know mom to the back and the moon, I get it, yeah. So some of these things are really quite nice and I love it. You're always um, in my heart. So. I, um, the important part of these quotes is love comes in many forms and how to express that love is between the two of you and no way um, is it wrong as long as the both of you are feeling good and that you love and that you're sharing. So cuddling um, literally kills depression, relieves anxiety and strengthens the immune system. So when the act of sexual intimacy is no longer possible, please don't forget how important cuddling is. So something is so simple is um, hugging. So my husband never leaves the house or I don't leave the house with a hug and a kiss. And every time he comes home, it's the same. So it makes us connect again and go, it matters. And we love each other. So don't forget how important touch and hugs matter. So let's take you back to the time when you were slow dancing with your loved one. Remember how great it felt, how you wanted to hold each other closer, how you didn't want the song to end, how you just kept smiling at each other and maybe you snuck in a kiss. Remember a dance can happen in your front room. It doesn't have to be on a dance floor. It doesn't have to be for the whole song. It could just be for one minute. It doesn't have to be that the old foxtrot that you used to do really, really well. It could just be a swaying of back and forth. And I make my husband do it on a regular basis and get up the chair and, and dance with me. And it doesn't have to be all the fun, fast things we learned when we were younger, but it brings us together and it makes us feel love. So don't hesitate. Um, even your mother, take your mom up and take her for a, a, a swing. And it just reminds her of the good time. Put a song on that they absolutely love to listen to. Good endorphins. For all the reasons listed above, take the time to dance and feel the love and the intimacy that it brings to your relationship. So I used this uh, picture in my last presentation, but I truly love it. Um, I see a couple that is touching and loving and enjoying a very special moment. And that's not the time for us to interrupt and go, hey, mom, it's time for your medications. Or, hey, mom, we got to get going. Or, hey, mom, where's this? Give them that moment. This is their time for their intimacy. This could be in the middle of a really big gathering where your family's all moving around but they're having that special moment and we need to protect that and support that um, because love and intimacy comes in many different levels and we need to give them the space and the time to enjoy that special moment together. So cuddling before bed, it relaxes the brain, it reduces the process of overthinking and it makes it easier to fall asleep. Now, if you happen to sleep with someone that I do that snores, the cuddling doesn't last long because he always falls asleep first, 
but it is that cuddling that helps us relax and get ready for bed. So don't hesitate, even to your parent, get in there and cuddle them. They will help them settle down and get to sleep. So cuddling always makes us feel loved and cherished. So I wanna take you back to the palliative care time when I worked at the hospital. Many years ago, I learned the importance of intimacy and sexual health and how the rest of us need to respect and provide privacy. As nurses, we were taught the hospital bed was to be very tight streets and, and literally bounce a quarter off it. I'm that old uh, that we had to. Uh, the bed was very much for the sick person only and no one else was even to sit on the corner of the bed. But we learned so much over the years and how important that intimacy and love and cuddling can literally help people's emotional well-being, reduces their pain level, reduces their stress level. So it's really important to use those. Um, and this quote reminds me of learning as a nurse on encouraging family to be okay to cuddle and see how better the patient's mood and pain to improve over the time and by feeling love. So don't forget a hug brings good endorphins that can make you both feel so much better and endorphins can literally reduce someone's pain level. So I wanted to give a shout out to amazing behavioral specialist nurse and her name is Janice Vance and she's from the Okanagan. And she has taught many nurses in the long-term care field about the importance of sexual health and intimacy for seniors. And research that she um, has shared with us is people have sexual desires throughout their lifespan and it might well remain sexually active into their 70s and 80s. All you have to do is think of Mick Jagger, uh, the Rolling Stones, and he's in his late 70s and he just had a baby. So it still goes on, it doesn't stop. Um, a study completed with older adults found that the reported rates of being sexually active between the ages of 57 and 64, which I'm in that group, is sitting at 75%. So I told my husband, I'm like, yay, we're in the 75% range. And he's like, yay, are we in that 75% range today? Mm -hmm. And I went, no, not today. So you need, you need to know that as we get older, it's very common and it's comfortable. And just because you go into long-term care doesn't mean that all of a sudden your sexuality and your intimacy stop. So it keeps going. The next group is the ages between 65 and 74 year olds, and they're sexually active up to 53% of the population. And then from 75 years old to 84 years old, their 26% are still sexually active. So the adage is, if you still got it, use it, really does hold true as you get older. So I want to talk about our parents and our seniors and people that might be in uh, care and long-term care. So what we've learned um, through the years, and Janice Vance has really helped us understand this, is that this is normal part of aging. It doesn't stop. Um, but we've created a great program, and it's a red heart, as you see on the screen. And what we do is we have the red heart, and it's hanging on a little... Um, easy little string and it's on the inside of the door and it's hanging on the door handle. And then when you want privacy, if you want intimacy, if you want to have some sexual fun, all you have to do is swing that um, red heart, put it on the outside of the door and that lets everybody know there's no going in that room for any reason unless the bell is rung um, or the door is opened or the heart goes off the door. and that really helps a lot of people that no longer have to worry about someone's coming in because particularly in long-term care we have a key to get in everywhere so a closed door doesn't mean that we're not going to knock and then enter so we've used the red heart system which is great but this is a really good idea to use in your own home so you know in college you always knew if there was a towel wrapped on that door handle you did not go in that room well the same thing is when you're in your own home you can live in a home that has multi-generational and a door closed and locked is a hint that do not go in do not even knock. That is a hint. There's a reason why that door is locked. Same thing in the bathroom. When the bathroom door is locked, you're not going, hello, what are you doing? You know that someone's busy in the bathroom. So it's the same thing in your home. You don't have to use a red heart, but it's a cute idea to say, this is my time. 
and I might just be cuddling. I just might want to enjoy my mother and just lay with my mother and keep her comfortable. But I don't want people knocking, going, hey, mom, where's this? Where's that? I just want some quiet, happy time. Maybe we're listening to soft music. So intimacy and love does not have to be just with a married couple. It can be with my mother and, and my father and cuddling with them and letting them know and sharing some good memories or sharing some nice music. It's a great way to share some intimacy. So the simple process really can be used in your own home. And it's a great way to remind everyone that love is normal. Intimacy is normal. Sexual health is absolutely normal. And that is my time. Um, and all we have to do is have young children or grandchildren and a door locked will slow them down. That doesn't mean they're not knocking on the door or underneath and breathing, um, but it will slow them down. So remember that your love, um, you need to feel love. You need to feel that you are um, not alone and that that can come in many different forms. And I've been fortunate enough to be married for 36 years now to my lovely husband, David. And one thing that we have done uh, since we were 16 and 18 years old is he's always held my hand everywhere we go. Everyone comments after knowing us, they're like, he always does that. And that shows you that he loves you. And I said, absolutely. When I was younger, I knew that he always wanted me by his side and that we loved him. As we got a little bit older, I realized that it was also because I no longer walked in a straight line anymore. And it was more about keeping me with him. Um, so I didn't trip or fall or stumble on something. Um, and lately now, as we even get older, it's more about not losing me because I tend to not communicate as effectively or I just wander off and he loses me completely. So there's many reasons why you can have intimacy out in the public holding hands. We tend to forget that we should be doing that with our parents too and going, you're not alone. I'm with you. I have you. And it's a great way to prevent your loved one from falling and tripping quite easily, especially in the winter months. So don't hesitate um, to think of it. So remember, holding hands provides um, you to connect and that you're sharing your love. So I want to remind all of us that love might be a four letter word, um, but it can bring us joy. It can bring us strong endorphins and those endorphins can improve our mood, reduce our depression and our loneliness and reduce pain just by touch. So I hope you take the time today to tell your partner, tell your parent, tell your children how much you love them, how much a gentle touch can bring peace of mind that your loved one is not alone and that they feel connected. You may try out the heart or the towel or just lock the door and have time just to be together and love each other. And remember that Ignore the world for a little bit. It can be in a public area as you saw with the seniors and just taking that moment to feel connected and feel loved. And that is a normal part of aging. Uh, so we need to respect that, that when you're going into your loved ones, uh, your parents' home, um, it might be your home and you've never ever knocked before. You just always walked in. You might want to see something you never really wanted to see. So always knock before you go into your parents' home, just to ensure that you're not interrupting that special moment that they might be having. So I hope this helped um, and feel loved for yourself, but also take care of the people that are around you. And don't forget that a gentle touch is one way to easily tell people that they are in your thoughts or in your prayers and that they're not alone. So from me to everyone else, have a good day. Thank you.